Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. So let us now uh, re recapitulate what we have done so far on uh, the historical background to the introduction to modern Indian drama. Right. So we began by talking about the earliest histories of Indian theatre, which were written by Horace Heyman Wilson's three-volume Select Specimens of the Theatre of the Hindus, which was published in 1827 in Calcutta, and Sylvan Levy's two-volume The Indian Theatre which were both clearly influenced by Orientalism in that they equated Indian theatre with Sanskrit theatre while dismissing the multilingual nature of Indian theatre, be it Sanskrit and other non-Sanskritic forms of theatre and performance. The colonial historiography of Indian theatre follows the Western chronological categories of ancient, medieval and modern, where Sanskrit theatre lasted from 200 BC, medieval or traditional theatre lasted from 1000 CE, to the present and modern theatre from the late 18th century to the present. Sanskrit theatre was modelled on Bharata's Nati Shastra, the ancient text and dramaturgy, which provided copious data on theoretical and practical aspects of theatre, from acting and dancing to music and prosody, the sizes and shapes of playhouses, costumes and makeup, theories of emotions and sentiments, requirements for critics and audiences, and so on. One of the earliest Sanskrit plays to be translated and studied by Orientalist missionaries and scholars were Kalidasa's Avignana Shakuntala, translated by William Jones and published in Calcutta in 1789, which was actually a multilingual play with lines in Sanskrit, Shauraseni, Maharashtri and Magadhi, and Shudraka's Mrichakatika or Little Clay Cart, which again comprised of many other languages that were lost in translation. Then we also looked at how there were other folk performative traditions of theatre that uh, uh, colonial theatre also incorporated into its own performances. And a lot of these folk performative theatres uh, rested on music and dance, which were absolutely indispensable to forms. But many of these traditions of, uh, of music and dance were dismissed or overlooked by colonial scholars as cru crude and low forms of performance art. Colonial era theatre drew on Western conventions of theatre in terms of lighting and scenography while shunning local forms of theatre as crude. But there was a turn back to pre-modern Sanskritic models of theatre which came to be revalued as classical because of nationalist aspirations. The attempt was to build an Indian nation that was both traditional and modern through a return to Hindu Puranic traditions. Thus the creation of Indianness was a political issue. The establishment of Indology in the mid 18th century enabled the possibility of this return to Sanskrit theatre because of the interest that European scholars had in understanding India's past. Thus, Sanskrit texts, both religious and secular, came to be preserved and transmitted. Even later histories of Indian theatre, like Hemendra Nath Das Gupta's four volume The Indian Stage, published in Calcutta between 1944 and 1946, and Ramlal Kanailal Yagnik's The Indian Theatre, did not acknowledge the presence of other theatre performance traditions in India. Many of the later histories of Indian theatre, written after independence, continue to emphasize the lasting importance of Sanskrit theatre on Indian theatre. Many actors did not have a sense of Western forms of the theatre and acting and incorporated folk techniques into their performances despite the growing modernization of Indian theatre. Under the rule of the East India Company, the early playhouses were set up in Calcutta. In 1775 was Calcutta Theatre, the Charangi Theatre in 1813, the Sanssouci Theatre in 1839, which were patronized by colonial officials. The colonial idea of theatre understood theatre as an enclosed space with a raised proscenium stage before rows of seats. It made theatre a spectacle to be watched by the audience who were at the same or higher level than the stage. Colonial theatre was an elite cultural art form that was patronised and frequented by the colonial western and Indian elite, particularly the Parsis of Bombay, who sponsored the early theatre companies. 
It was only the eight, in the late 19th century that theatre spread as a form of mass entertainment in Calcutta, Bombay and Madras to schools and colleges. Theatre became a commercial ticketed event and there was a new distinction between the actor manager and the director. So if the folk performance traditions of, of India relied solely on the actor and his body, the uh, director becomes an important figure who emerges in urban theatre who is the one who may not necessarily act in the play, but is the one who uh, enables the uh, actors to actually incorporate certain uh, folk and western forms of performance. The mere importation of the proscenium theatre did not modernise Indian theatre. Indian theatre in the 1770s was still an elite form of entertainment that was limited to small British populations in the three presidency cities of Madras, Bombay and Calcutta. The early plays that were staged in the late, latter decades of the 18th century addressed social issues like polygamy, child marriage, opium addiction, fate sanctioned violence, the plight of Indian women and so on. Dinabandhu Mitra's Neel Darpan is a famous example which was a polemical attack on the exploitative British indigo planters was, which was banned as seditious and precipitated the passing of the Dramatic Performances Act in 1876 to curb seditious and patriotic tendencies. Theatre scholar Anandalal argues that, and this is of course another important 19th century Indian playwright uh, whom we'll be discussing in greater, greater detail in this session. And this is just a few points introducing uh, Rabindranath Tagore's contribution to modern Indian theatre. Theatre scholar Anandalal argues that Rabindranath Tagore was the pivotal figure in modern Indian drama in terms of his imaginative stagecraft modelled after a Sanskrit aesthetics that attempted to transform Western theatrical modes of domestic realism and picturesque entertainment. His plays were controversial for the time as they dealt with female sexuality, the orthodoxies of Hinduism, untouchability, and also anticipated environmental concerns and revisited Buddhism as a Pacific faith. This is a quote from Anandalal's introduction to his translation of three plays by Rabindranath Tagore. Tagore was also known for introducing women to the stage, which included women even from quote-unquote respectable families at a time when male actors impersonated women. The beginnings of modern Indian theatre can be traced back to Parsi theatre. Parsi theatre was the dominant form of entertainment in urban India from the 1860s to 1930s. Early colonial era theatre companies were owned by elite Parsis, many of whom were wealthy bankers, traders and philanthropists. The term Parsi theatre itself is a conflicting one as the actors who joined these companies were Muslims, Hindus, Anglo-Indians and Baghdadi Jews. Their plays were also multilingual and performed largely in Gujarati, Marathi, and Urdu and English too. These plays were designed along western notions of stagecraft like backdrop scenery and were divided into acts and scenes. Many of these plays were published with detailed prefaces by the playwrights that illuminated their choice of language and the relationship to public. The Indian elites in Bombay, which included the Parsis, were invited to attend English language Bombay Theatre, also known as Theatre on the Green. Later on, an appeal was made by various notables like Jamshed Jiji Boy, Jagannath Shankar Set, and Frem Ji Koasji to found the Grant Road Theatre, which is located in the fort area of the native town to cater to the need of non-English language Indian plays. Until 1853, all performances in Grant Road Theatre were in English. Between 1865 and 1890, English was sidelined and the rivalry was between Gujarat, Gujarati and Urdu plays. All this information can be found in Catherine Hansen's uh, essays on Parsi Theatre. Grant Road was later supplemented by enlarged ones such as the Gaiety and Novelty near Victoria Railway Terminus. Established theatre companies like Elphinstone, Victoria and Alfred left behind their roots in amateur theatre and became more profitable for their Parsi owners. Shakespeare's plays were also adapted in these performances. There was an attempt by Parsi writers and intellectuals to build a history of their own in Gujarati that they traced back to Firdausi, the ancient king of the Parsis. They performed tales for the Shah Nama, Rustam and Sohrab and so on, which equated the Parsi theatre to the mythical history of the Persian homeland. There was also the presence of the so-called Hindu theatre in Bombay, which was driven by the notion of theatre for the Hindu people, propagated by William Jones and H. H. Wilson's translations from Sanskrit drama. These plays adopted regional folk styles. 
The portions of this thus not anglophilic as was assumed as they were keen on carving a distinct cultural identity for themselves through theatre. Dada Bhai Saurabh Shri Patel or Dadi Patel M.A. was a wealthy intellectual who became the secretary of the Victoria Theatrical Company in 1869 who commissioned the first play in Urdu. Although knowledge of the language was initially lacking among playwrights, actors and spectators. He popularized opera and professionalized theatre with full-time salaries and introducing so-called scientific stagecraft. Urdu plays were initially written in Gujarati script. Urdu was favoured also because of its traditions of poetry and music and song. The most important Urdu play that set off a new tradition of playwriting in Urdu was Indar Sabha by Agha Hasan Amanat in 1853. Although Hindu women were largely forbidden from acting on stage, there were male impersonators who played women and Anglo-Indian and Jewish actresses on stage. The performance of femininity on stage was a visual construction of bourgeois respectability on stage that contained her sexuality and created a new interiority identifying the idle woman with her capacity to suffer. Again, these are observations that Catherine Hansen makes on uh, female impersonation on the Parsi stage. Parsi theatrical companies travelled far to Ceylon, Calcutta, Rangoon, Peshawar and Sindh. Writers, actors, company managers, musicians, etc. belong to a mix of class, caste and religious backgrounds. Much of the anecdotal evidence of Im female impersonation is drawn from Catherine Hansen's translation of Somnath Gupta's scholarly Hindi monograph on Parsi theatre, which was based on the theatre notices of a one-time actor and photographer Dhanji Bhai Patel and the autobiographical pieces of female impersonators like Narayan Prasad Betab and Fida Hussain. With the establishment of the Victoria Theatrical Company in 1868, Parsi theatre became more professionalised when compared to the earlier notch performances by feudal aristocrats. Men with a pleasing figure and voice were required. When the Victoria Theatrical Company split, the former manager Dadi Patel took all the leading female impersonators with him to form the original Victoria Theatrical Company, leaving the next manager at a loss. Again, an anecdote uh, quoted from Catherine Hansen's essay on female impersonation in Parsi theatre. Female impersonation continued into the 20th century. There are few records of these actors' lives, with the exception of the non-Parsi actors like Jayashankar Sundari, 1888 to 1967, and Bal Gandharva, 1889 to 1975. And Catherine Hansen discusses these uh, different uh, male actors who played women in greater detail in her uh, book called Stages of Life, where she has fairly lengthy um, introduction to the lives of these actors, along with the translation of their autobiographical pieces of their experiences of playing women on stage. The female impersonator averted the potential slander and criticism directed to a transvestite. It thinly cloaked an aggressive heterosexual masculinity and by performing the wrong woman, the female impersonator was rendered harmless and worthy of sympathy. This is of course again Catherine Henson's observation of how female impersonators managed to actually tame and domesticate their masculine vigour and aggression by performing a wrong woman, a woman who was stigmatized and uh, oppressed by social norms. And uh, also by making her suffer infinitely, uh, made her into an object of public sympathy. The belief that men could do gender better than women perpetuated the control that men had over the theatre system and the public control over the female body and its representation. So again, this is again the fact that uh, only men performed uh, women for the longest time, uh, or for, the, for most of the times, and that itself became uh, a way of perpetuating the control that men had over uh, the, uh, the theatrical apparatus and uh, the female body and the representation of female uh, femininity and uh, suffering. The Anglo-Indian and Jewish actresses who played women passed off as Indian while embodying modernity through their fair skin and modern ways. So you also had women who played uh, women on stage, but these were not Hindu women. They were Anglo-Indian and Jewish actresses who had fair skin, but nonetheless tried to pass off as Hindu women on stage. There was an opposition to the participation of women on stage by the eminent Gujarati playwright K. N. Kabra, who formed the Natak Uttejik Mandali in opposition to the Victoria Theatrical Company that encouraged female involvement. But he also encouraged women to watch plays. 
the new Alfred Theatrical Company, which split from the parent company in 1891, again opposed the presence of women on stage. Dadi Patel employed many Muslim women in his production of Indar Sabha. The Anglo-Indian women who began acting in Parsi theatre adopted Hindu names, which signified an act of subordinating the Anglo-Indian actress, the feminine embodiment of the West, to the Indian male gaze. The actresses were cast in the image of the Huri or Pale Fairy, a familiar Indo-Islamic trope. So you have the Anglo-Indian woman playing Hindu women, adopting Hindu names uh, and signifying an act of subordination uh, of the Anglo-Indian actress to the gaze of the Indian male. The photographic image of the actresses on billboards and magazines were titillating in their impact leading the public to believe that they would witness foreign actresses perform. The Anglo-Indian actresses were thus both native as well as exotic other. Indian modern theatre drew from local folk traditions like Yakshagana, Tamasha, Ras Leela, Nautanki, Bhavai, Jatra and Khayal. Many of the post-independence drama dramatists like Habib Tanvir and Bal Sarkar, Girish Karnat and Vijay Tendulkar turned to folk traditions as what they thought was the essence of Indian theatre. The aim was to establish the importance of the actor as opposed to the urban playwright and the communal involvement and ritualistic action of rural societies. Hindu, Hindi and Urdu to theatre traditions drew from primarily religious Ramlila or Raslila traditions or secular ones like Nautanki or Swang. Again, Catherine Hansen has a longer study on uh, the Nautanki in her book on uh, the Nautanki traditions of theatre acting. Now, let's just turn to an introduction to some of the major uh, pre-independence uh, playwrights in, uh, in India. The early pre-independence playwrights like Bharatendu Harish Chandra, 1850-1885 in Hindi, Jayashankar Prasad, 1890-1937 again in Hindi, and Rabindranath Tagore, 1961-1941 in Bengali, were influenced by models of classical Sanskrit theatre. Prasad and Tagore shunned commercial theatre, which they believed was antith antithetical to the aesthetics and undermined the literary merit of the play. Most of Tagore's plays were performed in the privacy of his home, and Tagore acted as well as directed his own plays. Bharatendu Harish Chandra was highly impacted by the German playwright Bertolt Brecht. In her book on Harish Chandra and Prasad, Poetics, Plays and Performances, The Politics of Modern Indian Theatre, Vasudha Dalmia reveals the impact that Sanskrit theatre had on Harish Chandra. Dalmia observes that the national Indian theatre of the Hindus drew from the understanding and adaptations of Sanskrit theatre and Shakespeare. Unlike the metropolitan centres of Bombay, where Parsi theatre had become hugely popular, and Calcutta, the capital of British Imperial India, where the earliest houses were set up, there was no such metropolis in the Hindi Urdu belt of North India. The scene of Urdu Hindi theatre, which is becoming the new literary language of the country, shifted from Awadh after Wajid Ali Shah's end to Banaras. Harish Chandra belonged to a merchant family of Banaras, which had become one of the most important banking and trading, trading centres of northern India. Harish Chandra belonged to the Naupati Mahajans, aristocratic bankers who arbitrated disputes among merchant classes and mediated between British and the people of the city. Harish Chandra's friendship with the Maharaja contributed to the expansion of the Ram Leela of Ramnagar. He organized many gatherings of poets and musical evenings and, and maintained relations with the Asian society of Bengal in Calcutta. Although his lifestyle was rather extravagant and elite, his theater addressed a heterogeneous audience and reading public of Brahmins, mobile artisans and merchants that formed a political and socially operative public sphere. Even as he drew from Sanskrit categories, he also took recourse to popular forms in music and avoided the vulgar and the low to minimize the stigma of theatre. His early plays were translations of Sanskrit, Prat Prakrit, Bengali and Shakespeare. Dalmia argues that Harishandra's lively social, religious and political satires coexisted with a future vision of the nation-to-be which fell back on Dajput models of sovereignty. His radical critiques of existing structures of authority, Dalmia notes, were tempered by the very structures of authority that he was a part of. The merchant Rajput nexus that were linked up with romantic orientalist visions of the past, such as that of Edwin Arnold, the literary critic. 
From her reading of Harishchandra's long essay on drama called Natak, 1883, Harishchandra believed Sanskrit theatre had to be renewed to assimilate the new and traditional goals and conventions of drama, had to cater to the interests of contemporary politics and aesthetics, and thirdly, there had to be an appraisal of progress and the prospects of vernacular drama and the fraught questions of patronage in the creation of an incipient national theatre. For Harish Chandra, drama was Drishya Kavya or visual poetry, whose authors were Brahma, Shiva, Bharata, Narada, Vyasa and Valmiki, though its first exponent was Bharata. According to Harish Chandra, drama has three divisions, poetry mixed or poetical, Mishra Kavya, which is further sub subdivided into ancient and modern. The ancient was Sanskrit drama, which according to him was not a lowly form of art, but performed by all social groups for all. He tries to stretch Sanskrit categories into the present. In the modern category are included plays modeled on European drama, which are characterized by the repeated change of scene, which is implemented by the change in backdrop. Modern plays were further divided into Natak or drama, where narrative was predominant and Giti Rubak or musical drama where narrative is punctuated by song. These pl plays can have a tragic or comic or tragic comic ending. The second category of drama was pure spectacle or curiosity or Shuddha Kautuk and the third category corrupt or brushed. The second category includes puppetry, mime and feats of skill and the third category comprises includes those forms that once had theatricality but have now degenerated and become devoid of poetry. These include popular forms like Bhand, Indra Sabha, Tamasha and Yatra and religious tra traditions like Rasa, Leela and Janki. These are all uh, uh, taken from Vasudhalmiya's book on Harish Chandra and Jayashankar Prasad and the impact that Brecht had on these early 19th century uh, playwrights. For Harish Chandra, drama had five goals, comic, erotic, spectacular, social reform and patriotism. The last two are discussed for which old tales have to be reinterpreted. A public forum for the discussion of issues should be created and where love for the country can be created. Harish Chandra believes his play should be educative. The play can become a model of corrective ethical and political action if it becomes a metaphor for reformative practice. This Shakuntala, Ratnavali and Mrijakatika, Hamlet and Macbeth were exemplars in this regard because the actions in these plays best brought out the character's inner state of mind. So the, the emphasis for Harish Chandra was on, the, on capturing the psychological states of mind and the transformations in their psyche uh, in order to enable uh, corrective ethical and political action. And so for him, Shakuntala, Ratnavali, Vrachikatika, Hamlet and Macbeth are the, the exemplars of, um, of uh, plays of the social reformative and patriotic uh, function of uh, modern Indian theatre. Harish Chandra's plays were written in a mix of languages. The verse passages were almost entirely in Braj Bhasha, which resonated with Urdu or Kharibholi and was a style that was popularized by Am Amanat's Indra Sabha. His most important contribution was his translation of Shudraka's Sanskrit play Muddha Rakshasa that had been translated earlier by H. H. Wilson and to whose historical scholarship he is indebted. But in the process of adapting older plays including the famous Satya Harish Chandra and writing his own, Harish Chandra contemporizes them by setting them in Banaras and psychologically elaborating the characters and scenes in the form of popular street performers. Many of his plays were dealt with in a Shakespearean manner in terms of irony and symbolism. Harish Chandra was also known for his play Andhir Nagari, written in 1881, in the form of a folk tale that was an oblique critique of the tyranny of the British. Even the passing of the Dramatic Performances Act in 1876, playwrights and performers had to devise subtle and creative methods of critiquing the government. Some of Harishandra's later plays, like Neil Devi, were free of Sanskrit models and were written in a more Western mold as a political satire that offered a Hindu-Aryan view of history told from the perspective of Rajput commanders of the Delhi Sultanate where Muslims were perceived as aggressors and foreigners. With Harishandra's demise, 
and the consolidation of the British as an administrative power, there was hardly any patronage for Hindi theatre in a region that did not have the political or economic capital of the metropolitan cities of Calcutta or Bombay. Urban Hindi drama became increasingly divorced from folk forms and underwent a renewal only after the official support of Hindi as a national language after independence. However, as Dharmi observes, Hindi theatre also emerged as a literary form divorced from local and folk forms and official patronage that was perfected by Jai Shankar Prasad. Jai Shankar Prasad, 1886-1937, was also from Banaras and also belonged to a wealthy merchant family and was initially educated at home where he learned Sanskrit, Persian, Hindi and Urdu. His education abruptly ended with the death of his father but he acquired knowledge of a variety of Sanskrit texts on his own and had a contradictory relationship to the traditional past. If on the one hand his relationships with, with women was framed within the patriarchal mould, he would also fiercely demand equal rights for women. Although Prasad wrote plays and stories, he was best known for his lyrical poetry written in Sanskritized Hindi that established him as one of the major figures in the new romantic mov movement of Chayavad poetry. For Prasad, Chayavad embodied the fine ideals of Sanskrit literature that provided poets with a repertoire of emotion and feeling that marked a new form of intimacy and portrayed women with a new dignity in the relationships with men. Hindi had to acquire a new terminology to be able to express the abstraction of uh, emotions of characters and the inner states and the rhetoric of Chayavad poetry emerged in Prasad's plays at moments of emotional intensity. Chayavad was opposed to Yathartavad or realism in Hindi that came to be associated exclusively with the pain and suffering of the common masses under colonial rule. Prasad believed this exclusive social realist focus on the societal obstructions to intimate relationships was pessimistic and fatalistic and did not represent characters in all their human dignity and subtlety. He held Harishandra's plays responsible for this among what he thought was an imitation of Western realist strain of theatre that reduced individuals to their conflicts with society. The role of literature, according to Prasad Dalmia notes, was to create characters as a medium for creating rasa or emotion that did not necessarily correspond to but could be indicative of the subtle workings of the psyche. Literature had to fill the deficiencies in both Yathartavad or reality and Adarshavad or ideality for there was no gap in between them. Sanskrit drama for Prasad fulfilled the function of literature to be beyond representing history or promulgating social codes. Drama had to be renovated to create optimism in the spectator about the future. Prasad insisted on the creative experience of the self as the soul of poetry and drama, which opened up the possibility of focusing on the subjectivity of the dramatist and his characters. Prasad rejected Parsi theatre for its vulgarity, although as da Dalmia argues, his plays were formally drawn from the frames of Parsi theatre. In the absence of any urban theatre movement, Prasad's plays were meant to be read rather than to be performed and he believed that drama should adjust itself to the limit limitations of the existing stage rather than the other way round. Prasad had great love for the Bengali stage and its tasteful adaptations of western modes of theatre and simple stagecraft. He believed Hindi dramatists would have had the potential to build on the formal possibilities of Parsi theatre had it not been taken over by cinema and the talking film. Cinema had enabled the possibility of women acting, which is something that had not been the case with Parsi theatre. He made several references to Harish Chandra in his writings as the only Hindi playwright worthy of note, but was ambivalent towards Harish Chandra's devotional aesthetics that he drew from Vaishnava traditions in Bengal. Most of Prasad's plays were taken from the Puranas and ancient history with protagonists who had divine origins. Dalmya shows how Prasad in his plays addresses women's rights to independence and romantic choice and challenge Brahmanical orthodoxy, particularly practices like Sati. For this, Prasad deployed his own readings of historical sources of Hindu law like Kautilya's Arthashastra and Manu's Dharmashastras, which had to be read for their emancipatory possibilities. Thus, Prasad at once seems to uphold and undermine Brahmanical law and his inherent misogyny 
or most of his plays borrowed some of the conventions of Western theatre and Parsi theatre in terms of the, of the narrator, melodramatic songs and scenography. Another important early playwright was Rabindranath Tagore, 1861-1941, whose plays underwent many transformations. His early plays were influenced by the reading, his reading of Shakespeare and the Romantic poets, especially Robert Browning. But his later plays, which focus on man's quest for union with the universe, theatre scholar Anandalal argues, is his own product. This is man's quest for union with the universe, was Tagore's own product. Lal suggests that the scholarship and literary critics have insisted on the influence of Western theatre on Tagore's plays, which Lal rightly argues is itself a legacy of colonial education and thought that considers anything that possesses merit to be derivative of the West. So Anandalal is actually arguing against many of the scholars who have criticized Tagore for not being a merit-worthy uh, playwright because he does not imitate or does not entirely draw from uh, Western forms of theater. Most of the scholarship on Tagore as a dramatist considers him to be a second rate and he is better known and appreciated for his fiction and poetry. His plays were considered to be unstageable and were meant to be read some scholars thought. Although, as Lal points out, his plays were performed within the privacy of his home and in specific theatres. Tagore's symbolic plays were considered to be better read as short stories than performed as plays. Anandala suggests that it was the emphasis on naturalistic theatre that made it difficult for critics to accept some of Tagore's more complex symbolic plays to be accepted as plays worth staging. A lot of the damage done to Tagore's reputation as a dramatist had to do with his weak translations of his own plays that did not succeed in capturing the spirit of his plays or often recreated his plays to read like original works in their own right. Translations of his plays into other Indian languages were also mediated by his own English translations. Tagore grew up in a Bengali world of theatre that had adapted and incorporated Western conventions of theatre and had begun to look down upon folk forms like Yatra or Jatra. The first Bengali playwright, Tarka Ratna, 1828-1886, had written plays on the plight of Hindu women. Michael Madhusudan Dutt, 1824-1873, wrote satirical comedies and Dina Bandhu Mitra, 1830-73, produced polemics of the colonial regime, especially Neil Darpan, that had been banned for its attack on the British indigo planters and the exploitation of helpless Bengali peasants. And Girish Chandra Ghosh, 1844-1912, was another author of more than 70 mythological historical plays who was another important figure in the field of Bengali theatre. Tego's earliest plays included the musical play Valmiki Pratibha, which he wrote when he was 20 in 1881 and was performed at his family home. His early poetic dramas Raja Orani 1889 and Visarjan 1890 were tragedies modelled after the English Restoration. Chitrangada 1892 was a lyrical play about human beauty and love that was inspired by Tego's observations of the Bengali peasant and his mystical relationship with nature during his stay at his family estates in East Bengal. He later tried his hand at blank verse and prose to produce short comic skits and one-act plays. After a series of tragedies in his life that included the loss of his wife, son, daughter and father, Tagore went on to dramatize his earlier works of fiction and write some of his most well-known plays like La Raja, Achalayatul, Dagkar and Falguni, which were part of a seventh cycle of season plays that began with Sharadotsav. Tagore further rewrote some of his earlier plays to make them more stage-worthy and towards the end of his play produced two symbolic plays, Mukta Dhara and Rakta Garvi, which satirized the political oppression of subjugated people and the exploitation of natural resources. Tagore grew keen in incorporating dance, especially what were considered rigid classical forms of Indian dance, into his plays to loosen their classical style to express the emotional intensity of the characters, much the disapproval of music and dance purists. His later plays gestured his interest in Buddhism and his dissatisfaction with the spoken word, which compelled Tagore to draw from diverse dance traditions, both within and outside India. So again, I draw a lot from Anandala's introduction to uh, his translation of three of Tagore's plays. 
Tagore took liberties with his old scripts, constantly modifying it to suit every performance. In fact, his scripts, as Lyle observes, were only skeletons for the performance that took diverse forms. According to Tagore, theatre best captured the imagination of the actor and spectator when it was devoid or made minimal use of scenery and the stage and relied more on the abilities of the actor to mime her surroundings. It was a minimal use of stage uh, craft and the scenery and, and the emphasis entirely on the actor's ability to mime her surroundings. This is unlike the European who, according to Tagore, needed to seek concrete truths and realistic representations of reality. This came through in the plays he directed and performed in his school Shantaniketan in the 1900s and 1910s. Not only did Tagore enable the possibility of women acting alongside men on stage, he also wrote plays that had a woman-only cast. Even when his plays were staged in Calcutta, they retained a minimalist stagecraft. Some of his plays had a chorus of singers who sat off stage to sing for the actors on stage. Tagore mostly avoided professional theatre for its commercial pressures and stage restrictions, although few of his plays did go on to become box office hits. After Tagore's death, Shomu Mitra's theatre group, Bahurupi, went on to perform some of Tagore's later plays in Calcutta and outside Bengal. So that was a, a very brief overview of these three important 19th century playwrights, uh, Rabindra Tagore, um, Bhartendu Harish Chandra and Jai Shankar Prasad. Now for a brief overview of post-colonial Indian theatre. Theatre scholar Aparna Dharwadkar locates the beginnings of post-colonial Indian theatre in three events. The formation of the Indian People's Theatre Association or IPTA in 1943. The deliberations of the first drama seminar organized by the newly constituted Sangeet Natak Academy in 1956 and the two-week Nehru Centenary Theatre Festival organized by the Sangeet Natak Academy in 1989. The IPTA was the first national level theatre movement in India and operated as the cultural front of the Communist Party of India, which sought to combat fascism and imperialism drawing from several similar international movements. The formation of IPTA paralleled the Progressive Writers Association that was established in 1936. The IPTA was against the commercial glamour of contemporary theatre and relied on local performative forms to reject colonial commercial forms of the 19th century. As Malini Bhattacharya states, IPTA had two objectives to develop experimental forms outside the naturalistic confines of commercial theatre and to present real contemporary struggles against fascism, imperialism and economic exploitation by drawing from India's traditional arts. The most successful example of IPTA plays was Bijan Bhattacharya's Nabonno or The New Harvest, 1944, first produced by Shombu Mitra, which is the beginning of post-colonial theatre in India. In practice, however, IPTA kept social realism as its aesthetic focus and experimented with both indigenous and western forms. The IPTA movement was ignored, if not dismissed in nationalist histories and statements on Indian theatre as a form of theatre that had paid no attention to aesthetics or the aesthetic unity of Indian culture and instead sought to harness art for its political ideologies and propaganda. These thinkers were, of course, oblivious to the class differences that, that undermined any notion of a national consciousness. Finally, it was the ideological differences between the Communist Party's political program and Nehru's Fabian Socialist Democracy, Dharwadkar argues, that undermined the radical nature of the IPTA and transformed the CPI, the Communist Party of India, and its cultural front into a more revisionist party. In its five-day seminar on drama, Sangeet Natak Academy in 1956 saw theatre as a medium of cultural reconstruction and social reform. Notable writers and playwrights and directors like Mulkaraj Anand, Adhya Rangacharya, Shobhu Mitra, Ibrahim Al-Ghazi, Balraj Sani, Dina Gandhi and so on, critiqued the obsoleteness of colonial theatre and felt that the future of Indian theatre lay in its folk traditions and not its commercial theatre that was restricted by the proscenium arch. Thus, serious non-commercial theatre, they felt, was the future of Indian theatre. Shombu Mitra's Bohrupi and Ibrahim Al-Khazi's theatre group were examples of non-professional but artistically serious groups that set the trend for post-independence Indian theatre. The seminar further recommended that the Indian government repeal 
the colonial law of censorship against seditious theatre, exempt theatre from entertainment tax, to allocate funds for new and struggling theatre companies, and set up a central institute for comprehensive training in theatre. But, and in 1989 festival marking Nehru's 100th birth anniversary, the Sangeet Natak Academy came up with a list of notable plays and playwrights that anticipated the emergent drama canon. But from the seminar, what emerged was the fact that despite the urge to build the gap, bridge the gap between urban and rural theatre, most of the theatre groups were urban based and employed urban actors. Parsi theatre drew from Western conventions of theatre, including lighting and scenography, and drew from Perso Arabic performance, poetic and musical traditions like the Shahnama, Arabian Nights, the singing and performance traditions of 19th century Indian courtesans, Victorian melodrama from Shakespeare as performed by Western touring companies, European realistic narrative structures, British amateur theatricals, and the visual regime of Raja Ravivarma. But later post-independence playwrights were more keen on incorporating folk traditions which they transformed and adapted in their own plays, both folk traditions as well as Puranic myths. Thus playwrights like B.V. Karanth and K.S. Karanth included Yakshagana, a northern Karnataka tradition of folk theatre which included the use of masks, singing and percussive instruments along with dancing. The first generation of post-independence playwrights like Vijay Tendulkar, Girish Karnad, Habib Tanvir and Bal Sarkar came to constitute what was called the theatre of roots that was prominent from the 1960s to the 1980s. So also Erin B. Erin Mee's book on the roots of, uh, on uh, the theatre of roots which is also another important source for this introduction. The objective of this style of theatre was to recover and revive pre-modern theatrical forms that were said to be free of the contamination of the colonial encounter and to get rid of the proscenium theatre in order to enable a greater intimacy between the actor and the spectator. Some feeble attempts were initially made in the 1960s and 70s by making actors sit in the audience such as crowd or, or processional scenes in the auditorium. This was a process of decolonization of Indian lifestyle, values, social institutions, creative forms and cultural modes. Ibrahim al Qazi, as director of National School of Drama, used a variety of spaces to perform his plays also because the school never had a proscenium theatre. The Bengali playwright Bal Sarkar used ordinary halls and public parks and rejected proscenium theatre to form something that came to be called third theatre. Thus theatre was used to create its own space rather than the other way around, thus blurring the very distinction between the performance space and the space of the audience. This can be clearly seen in the travelling performances of the Leela tradition. And after breaking away from Western realism, the new theatre took to stylization to transform the dramatic text into performance and performative space. As theatre scholar Suresh Avasthi points out, the staging science in realistic theatre was kept to a minimum to retain the integrity of the verbal science, but in stylistic theatre, stage directions were maximized that considerably lengthened the duration of the performance. The emphasis in the theatre of roots movement is on form, form that is integral to the content. This form involved the art of the actor and not the dominance of the director, as Avasti argues. And this, this can be seen in the plays of K. N. Panikar, who used Kathakali and Kudiyattam, or Ratan Tiyam and his use of Manipuri martial arts, and B. V. Karanth, who deployed Yakshagana. The role of the actor is to decode the stylized codes of the script, Avasti says, and encode it in the production. There is no rehearsal but rigorous training that the actors require in traditional dance forms while each performance of the text is unique and to an extent extempo. It was the stylized quality of Sanskrit dramas that drew Panikar, Karanth and Tiyam to the Sanskrit classics and each director produced a new stylized adaptation of the classic that was a new performance in its own right. Music and dance is more functional and integral to the performances and the actors often step in and out of character. Like Harish Chandra earlier, Brecht had this decisive influence on Karanth too, who often imagined the actor maintaining and, dist and distance from and uniting with the character he plays to create a defamiliarizing effect. 
other playwrights like Ratan Tiyam drew from the theatre of roots as practiced by Shanta Gandhi, Habib Tanvir, K. N. Panikar to make theatre into a spectacle which is mostly shorn of language and emphasized the ability of silence and the movements of the actor's body to communicate to the audience. He drew from Manipuri martial arts and the lyrical Vaishnava traditions of Manipur, thus exposing the very idea of traditional theatre as an ideological construct that critiqued modern societies and the unitary spirit of nationalism that attempted to erase all difference and the very presence of colonialism. But the very process of self-conscious recovery was itself conditioned by colonial knowledge, which irreversibly transformed folk elements of Indian theatre to cater to the needs of urban theatre, much of which was performed within the stationary enclosed space of the proscenium theatre. So this is a very important point that uh, these theatre scholars make, which is that the very process, the very act of trying to revive and recuperate earlier folk forms was itself inflected, mediated, conditioned by colonial knowledge, so that it was no longer possible to actually uh, recover uh, an innocent form of uh, pre-colonial theatre, which had not been touched by the lens of uh, colonial urban theatre. This was a far cry from the mobile open air theatre of Indian folk and street theatre where natural light was used and there was no scenography and the play itself depended on the actor rather than the playwright or the director. There may not have been any script in the first place. The idealism of the new nation was followed by the disillusionment with the nation which set the tone for the dark social realism, realism of the 1950s and 60s in the plays of Dharamvir Bharti in Hindi, 1926-1997, Mohan Rakesh, 1925-1972, Vijay Tendulkar, 1928-2008, who all shared an existential vocabulary that exposed social corruption. Girish Karnad, born 1938, reconstructed myths to a modernist idiom where characters were internally divided by their own desire for power and love. Another important figure who put in place the modernist, realist idiom in Hindi theatre was Ibrahim al -Kazi. His staging of Mohan Rakesh's Ashad Ka Ek Din, or A Day in the Month of Ashad, and Dharamvir Bharti's Andha Yug, or The Blind Age, represented these plays in unprecedented realist detail. al paid more attention to stage pictures, which are quite distinct from Parsi theatre or B. V. Karan's experiments. Theatre scholar Aparna Dharvarkar argues for a new imagination of Indian theatre, not as a singular essence or as a multilingual disparity of performative texts, but as a network of interactive possibilities, an aggregate of texts and performances mediated by aesthetic choices, institutions and reception, reception contexts. She identifies three models of authorship among post-independence playwrights, where the playwright simultaneously performed other roles as theor theorist and director. In the first group, she includes Dharambir Bharti, known for his Hindi play Andhayog, Mohan Rakesh, known for his Hindi plays Asharka Ek Din and Aadhe Adhure, Girish Karnad, G.P. Deshpande, Mahesh Alkanchwar and Mohit Chattopadhyay, whose plays were primarily meant to be read as literary texts rather than to be performed and whose plays approximated the early generation of playwrights Tagore, Michael Madhusudan Dutt, Jay Shankar Prasad and Prem Chand. The second category of playwrights, Vijay Tendulkar, Satish Alekar and Chandrasekhar Kambar, collaborate with resident playwrights, directors and actors even as they retain their literary identities. The success of both these categories of playwrights, Dharwarkar argues, lay in the publication of the playwrights of, the, of their plays in the respective languages and their translation to other languages, particularly Hindi, that brought them to critical attention and enabled the circulation and performance by other critical readers. This was first enabled by the Sangeet Natak Academy to forge a modern canon of Indian theatre, where even playwrights translated each other's works to make them available to a wider audience. The third model of playwrights includes Utpal Dutt, Badal Sarkar, Habib Tanvir, K. N. Panikar, Ratan Tiyam and Mahesh Dattani, who are authors, actors, directors and founder managers of their own experimental theatre groups. This lent them greater flexibility and skill and freedom as artists to create their own aesthetic. In an institutional culture where directors have been trained over playwrights, there have also been important collaborations between directors and the playwrights they choose to patronise. 
but there have also been multiple choices of performance in a diverse the theatre culture where the playwright and the script are not the only determinant factors but coexist with many folk traditions where the performance itself is central. So we need to have uh, uh, any history of modern Indian theatre has to uh, take into consideration these different uh, traditions, these different forms and not try and assimilate them into any uh, particular monolithic essence which suits or caters uh, to the aspirations of nationalism. The first historical movement identified theatre with the nation from 1870s to 1940s in regional expressions of Marathi and Bangla and national level organizations like the Indian People's Theatre Association and Bharatiya Natya Sangh. The second developed a, re a revisionary account of theatre and its role in post-independence India and the establishment of the Sangeet Natak Academy. The third led to the proliferation of theatre activity outside the radical position of the 1940s and revisionary discourses of the 1950s. So this is a brief overview of the late 19th century playwrights and, and an overview of post-colonial Indian theatre. Thank you.